Video games are a beautiful medium. In their worlds of ones and zeros, they offer a unique opportunity. Games make us a part of something. Every game could be considered a puzzle, some letting us unravel the lives of other people. I like games about people. Today, I'd like to talk about the best game ever made. There's a word that comes to mind every time I think about Silent Hill 2, harmony. While the game can certainly be appreciated for just its story, what I find a more interesting topic of discussion is the harmony between its story and its gameplay. I used to think that the gameplay in Silent Hill 2 was an afterthought, that it was inconsequential because its systems weren't fleshed out enough, but I don't think I've ever been so wrong about a game. It wasn't until I read about the game's different endings that I realized that Silent Hill 2's gameplay is part of its story. That the way you play Silent Hill 2 determines not only the fate of James, but who James really is. So how does Silent Hill 2 achieve this? How does James Sunderland reflect the player's choices despite not being a personalized avatar? And just how does Silent Hill 2 create a story so impacted by its gameplay while it presents the same story to all of its players? It all begins with Silent Hill 2's reason to play. The game opens with James Sunderland arriving in Silent Hill after receiving a letter from his late wife Mary. Video games, now more than ever, try to engage players in countless ways. Sometimes with excitement, sometimes with shock, a game's opening is meant to suck the player in, but no game does this as easily as Silent Hill 2. It's an impossible premise. After all, a dead person can't write a letter. The idea of a loved one sending you one last piece of themselves or the chance for closure, however unlikely, doesn't just create intrigue, it demands it. The game's premise is also the first look into its protagonist, James. We know nothing about him besides the fact that he wants to believe this letter is real and has traveled to this town to find out if it is. This opening is a one-two punch that immediately gets what it wants from the player. You both relate to James's situation and sympathize with him. You want to help James get to the bottom of this. By so quickly immersing the player in such an intimate situation, the game captures the player and can present its narrative with their full attention. Something that it knows it needs to maintain as evidenced by the elevator quiz show where you're rewarded for paying attention to the game's smaller details. What was that? This level of control is important for the game for a number of reasons. The presentation of its story needs to be neutral for gameplay and ambiguous for story, at the same time. It's impossible to tell a story like the one in Silent Hill 2 without ambiguity. The bridge on this journey is severed, for example, if Laura is less subtle about having known James before he enters Silent Hill. What's a little girl like you doing here anyway? Huh? Are you blind or something? It drip feeds the player information to keep them going, but what it does in between these segments is the magic. It will present elements like characters, situations, or paradoxes, and then let you determine what's happening, but more importantly, how to interpret it. The game creates a story that is impacted by gameplay by letting the player free after these moments of intrigue. It gives them choices about how to proceed with the information given, and tallies these choices internally to generate its endings. Silent Hill 2 operates on a point system. Certain actions taken during the gameplay will score you points towards certain endings. What separates Silent Hill 2 from virtually every other game that has a system like this is the nuance and amount of these choices and how the player does not even realize they're making them. And not because they're obscure and have no correlation to their endings, but because the choices are so natural and human that they don't even register as gameplay. This is a big part of the reason why a first-time Silent Hill 2 player doesn't realize how much influence they actually have over James. You cannot go into a character creator and make James. 
However, you can make James do things that make him a different person. Though there's numerous combat systems and character-based choices that achieve this in the game, the first example I want to focus on is when James meets Maria. Mary? No, you're not. Do I look like your girlfriend? Though she looks like Mary, her demeanor is quite different, or at least different enough to convince James that she's not his wife. The game shows us this cutscene and then allows the player to determine if Maria is a person of interest. If she is, then James will spend time with her, which gives the player the first point towards the Maria ending. One could argue that spending time with her is an extension of exploration before you get to Pete's Bolorama, but just being with her doesn't give you enough points for her ending. The player cannot bump into Maria an excessive amount of times. They can't harm her, and they can't be outside her vicinity for more than five minutes. All of these things remove points from her ending. It should be obvious why the first two do, but being around Maria grants you a point because… it's human. If you're interested in someone, you're not going to run around a town full of monsters leaving them behind and making them catch up to you. You're obviously not going to keep bumping into them or be a lunatic and hit them for no reason. By being near Maria for this amount of time and not leaving her behind, you're telling the game that James likes Maria. You're coming with me? You were gonna just leave me? No, but... With all these monsters around? No, I just... I'm all alone here. Once you get to Pete's, the requirements for her ending become more complex, because the relationship between James and Maria gets more complex. Before we talk about the escalating nature of these choices, however, I want to take some time to appreciate this scene. Laura, is that her name? That's what she said. This town is full of monsters. How can you sit there and eat pizza? This is a funny line, but there's a hypocrisy to it that I love. James scolds Eddie for eating pizza in the middle of everything that's going on. We all know Eddie is a glutton, so Silent Hill gives him a pizza. But what happens right before this scene? Silent Hill gives James Maria. James says that he wants Mary, the reason he's in Silent Hill to begin with, but the town gives him a more seductive version of his wife. The town gifts both James and Eddie what they want, but James chastises Eddie while being blind to what the town is telling him. The beauty of Silent Hill 2 is that this scene can be viewed in multiple contexts depending on the ending you get. If you're playing for the first time and get the leave ending, then James is merely hypocritical. If you're trying to get the Maria ending, then James is considerably more delusional because of how he's slowly replacing his wife with someone who was born from a wish. After Pete's, the requirements for the Maria ending become more nuanced. Maria cannot correct James on the directions to the hospital. James needs to visit Maria in the hospital room he leaves her in. And once you get to the labyrinth and find Maria dead, James needs to try to enter the room again. If you make all of these choices, you're no longer telling the game that James just likes Maria. These actions are those of a person who is in love with another, something acknowledged by the final opportunity for a point towards any of the game's endings. If you skip the conversation between Mary and James in the hallway before the end of the game, it will subtract a point from the leave and in water endings. Because of course it would. If you've done everything for the Maria ending, by that point in the game, James does not want Mary so why would he listen to one of their old arguments? Similarly, if you've done everything for the in-water ending, listening to this conversation adds a point because listening to it adds to James's guilt and his decision to take his own life. Isn't it amazing how human all of this is? There are no choices in this game that don't mirror the actions a person would take if they were actually in these situations. And these choices are never explicit enough or binary enough that they are recognized as gameplay mechanics. My favorite among these is Angela's knife. Oh, it's you. 
Yeah, I'm James. <sighs> Angela. Angela, okay. I don't know what you're planning, but there's always another way. This cutscene establishes Angela's knife as an object with suicidal connotations. So if you examine the knife in your inventory, it adds a point for the in-water ending. It tells the game that you might be contemplating suicide, just like Angela was, as literally and physically examining a knife in this context would suggest. It's so simple, but this is how the game reflects player choice in James. It even does it through combat. Being reckless in the game and not healing James often tells the game that he has little regard for his own life giving you a point for in water. Healing over 200% of your health tells the game that James has a reason to live and gives you a point for leave. There are no wasted mechanics or moments in Silent Hill 2, which is why the game feels like one continuous experience. It's a game segmented by what every other game is segmented by, but because everything outside of its gameplay feeds directly into it, one never feels like the game is actually split up by these things. And because the gameplay affects the story immensely, its six different endings result in six different playstyles. You may still be asking, how does the gameplay affect the story if it's the same story but only the endings are different? This is simple. I've seen great deliberation through the years about what the canon ending of Silent Hill 2 is. Everyone has their own interpretations of how James would deal with his guilt over killing Mary, but the mistake most people make about the endings is assuming that there's only one James. What is the canon ending of Silent Hill 2 is the wrong question. The right question is, who is the canon James? Is the canon James the one that leaves Silent Hill with Laura after forgiving himself? Or is the canon James the one that succumbs to his guilt? Is it the one that replaces Mary with Maria? Or the one that is so unable to move on that he tries to resurrect her? These are all different people. The choices James makes to get to one ending directly contradict choices made in others. The endings don't happen in a vacuum. The player's guidance of James makes him a fundamentally different person from the second he leaves the bathroom at the start of the game. I don't believe there is a canon James, which is the game's ultimate respect for the player and how the gameplay affects the story. The canon ending is whatever you want it to be, because every way that James deals with his guilt is valid and allowed by the game. Having this many endings of equal importance that don't punish the player with trivial morality or cast judgment on them is nothing short of incredible. Its endings are logical conclusions to the way you decided to play the game, and are, as is the entire game, a beautifully haunting look at the human condition. You know what I heard? This whole area used to be a sacred place. I think I can see why. It's too bad we have to leave. Please promise you'll take me again, James. 